any rate, all right, let's pray. I need to get into this. Okay, let's stop talking about a building. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a target to shoot at. Lord, we are not going through this life aimlessly or blindly. Lord, we have... We have this incredible book that gives us direction and clarity. And so I pray, God, today that you would speak to our life through this word. And uh, Lord, make us more like you. That's what we're looking for every day. Make us more like you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start a walkthrough series. And we've been doing a walkthrough series for uh, about seven years now. And for, for those of you that don't know, you, Fusion is a part of a larger network. Um, we started a couple of different churches. We got a couple of different churches going in Lexington. And we started doing walkthrough series quite a while ago. And the reason we started doing a walkthrough series is we read a statistic. Now, I don't know if it's a true statistic because not everything you read on the internet, and this might blow some of your mind, uh, but not everything you read on the internet is true, Okay. Uh, for some of you, you need to hear this, though. Some of the things you read on the internet are true because uh, there's other people that don't believe anything's true. One of the statistics that we read on the internet was that 80%, everybody say 80%. That's a whole lot. 80% of all Christians had never read through, and you think I'm going to say the Bible, but that's not the statistic. 80% of all Christians had never read through a single book of the Bible. And when we heard that, we're like, that can't be true. And we're like, if it is true, it's kind of heartbreaking. Like 80% of the people have never finished an entire book of the Bible because there are 66 books in the Bible, okay? Some of them are very long. Some of them are very short. What I'm going to read out of 1 John, very, very, very short book of the Bible. 80% of, of believers have never read an entire book of the Bible. So we figured, you know what, if we preach through an entire book of the Bible and we read it in its entirety, at the end of it, you would be able to say, I at least have read one book of the Bible. I've at least read two books of the Bible. Well, we've done this eight or nine times now and read through eight or nine different books of the Bible. So we're trying to get people just to, to, just to ingest the word of God. And so without further ado this morning, I'm going to have you stand to your feet. We're going to read 1 John chapter 1 together. And it's not very long, okay? So we're going to read it together. It's going to be right up there on the screen. It says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ we write this to make our joy complete this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that god is light in him there is no darkness at all if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness we lie and do not live out the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Father, thank you for your word. Change our lives with it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First John is, is actually the authorship of, of First John is given to the same John that wrote the, the gospel of John. Okay, John the Beloved. And uh, he also wrote some other books in the Bible. And one of the most famous books of the Bible that he wrote that people talk about right now is the book of Revelation. I love John. I love John as a disciple. I love him as a person. John was was the only apostle, he was the only disciple that did not die of, of persecution. Now, he was persecuted, but he was the only disciple of Jesus's that died of natural causes, but he did get boiled in hot oil, according to oral tradition, because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And then later on in life, he would be exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he would spend the rest of his life, and he would pen the book of Revelation. And, and John was called the beloved of Jesus. He was the disciple that, that laid his head on the chest of Jesus and was the beloved of Jesus. I also love the fact that the gospel 
gospel that says that John was the beloved of Jesus is actually the gospel of John, which means John wrote that about himself. He's like, I'm Jesus's favorite. It's right there in the gospel. See that right there? And he was. Uh, he was the one that was told to look after Jesus' mother when he was hanging on the cross. And he said, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And he, he took care of Jesus' mom, and, 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 and Jesus loved him, and he was special. And he goes through all of these things, and he writes these last few books of the Bible and has a lot to say. And he watches his, his friends die. He watches his his fellow apostles die. Some of them are quartered. They're, they have a horse tied to their hands and to their feet, and they send the horses in different directions, and it rips their body apart. Some of them are impaled for their faith. The, the, Bible, or the Bible talks about them, not, the world not being worthy of these men. And we know, according to like oral tradition, that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't count himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner of his Savior. John has watched all this happen. He's watched Romans rise to power. He's watched all awful things happen to the church. And at the end of his life, he still writes this, that God is love, that God is love. He has experienced things in his life where he could have the why God and but God moments. Why would you do this to me, God? But God, how could you allow this to happen to me? Why would you ever let me go through this? Why would you let me be boiled in hot oil? Why would these men who've served you their whole life or have given everything, why would you let them go through what they're going through? Why wouldn't you protect them? He's had those moments in his life where he could have chosen to say anything about God. He could have chosen to walk away from God. And at the end, of it all, he still decides that God is love. Now, I don't know about you, and maybe maybe I'm the only one in here. I've been through moments where I didn't understand God, and I've watched things happen that have caused me to take pause. And some of us have been through things in here where we watch it happen, and we're like, why would you do this to me, God? God, you, you must not like me. John watches stuff like this happen, and we can't deny that he watches stuff like this happen. We know what he goes through. But John wants us to understand there's, a, there's another subset of things that he has seen. And he starts, this, he starts this book off by saying that which was from the beginning. And he says, which we have heard. He, he wants us to understand when he starts writing this word. He wants, he wants us to understand, I have heard this. I have seen this with my own eyes. I have looked at Jesus myself. My hands touched the man. And what I'm about to write you is not because somebody told me about Jesus. What I'm about to write you is not because grandma told me about Jesus. What I'm about to write you is not because mama told me about Jesus. What I'm about to write you is not because my neighbor witnessed to me and told me about Jesus. What I'm about to write you is not because of some book I have read. What I'm about to write you is because of what I have personally heard. What I'm about to write you is because of what I have personally seen. And I want to let you know that what I'm about to write is because my hands have personally touched the hands of this man himself. And at the end of all of my ministry, at the end of my life, even though I have watched all of these things happen, I want you to understand I was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. I was there when he fed thousands of people with just a few fish and just a few loaves. I was there when he healed blind Bartimaeus. I was there when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. I was there when he talked about having a, a leper be clean. I was there watching as the roof was torn off of the house and people raised or lowered this man down in the house and he healed this man. And so I want you to know that you can argue with me about what I'm about to write. But a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And he wants us to understand that what I'm about to write, you can take it to the bank because somebody didn't tell me about it. I experienced it. And sometimes in our faith, sometimes in our faith, we really struggle. People will try to explain away the, the good things that are happening in our life. People will try to say, you know what? I understand you laid down alcohol, but was it really God you put in the work? I understand that your marriage was broken and you gave it to Jesus, but did, did Jesus really fix your marriage or did, or did you fix your marriage? I, I understand that this broken relationship you had with your child was 
was fixed and you think you prayed at an altar, but did Jesus really fix it or did you fix it? People will ask you these questions and they will try to get you to question your experience with their argument. And Paul or John wants us to know, I'm telling you about my experience. Listen, after 20 years in ministry, I have watched it over and over and over and over. I've watched people who have been into alcohol and I'm not talking about having a drink with dinner. I'm talking about they have a drink for dinner. It is their dinner. I've watched people who have, who have been absolutely wasted away with drugs. I've watched marriages that have been to the brink and seem like they're never going to come back. And I've watched them try everything else. I've been around people who have tried everything else to lay down the bottle. And this, this has worked. I've watched people try to fix their marriage and they've been to counseling and nothing else worked. And this, this has worked. I've watched this help people in every circumstance and situation. I've watched people who've gone through hard things with their kids. And this is the only thing that helped get them through what they were going through. And I've watched it over and over and over and over. And John wants us to understand what I'm about to tell you. And you need to hear it today. What I'm about to tell you is not from an argument. It's based off of experience. It's based off of experience. And so John sets us up this way. It's based off of what I've seen, the truth of God. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The first truth that John drops on us about Jesus is that God is light. And he says this, he says, you know what? This is a message we've heard from him. God said this about himself. He's the light. He's the light of the world. Can I get an amen? I was actually sitting back in that room and I'd said this first service. I was sitting back in this room during worship and I heard the, I heard the song, this little light of mine, come on back there. It actually came on today and I was thinking, man, that's funny. I'm talking about God being light and they're, they're doing this little light. It's probably because you guys sing that song every single week and you do get a new CD. Okay. You're like, get a CD, sir. We don't even have CDs. Uh, I, we teach our kids songs like that. This little light of mine. And we talk about not hiding our own light. And we recognize that our light really isn't our own light. Our light is the light of God on the inside of our life. And John starts off by telling his listeners that God is light. God said it about himself, but he doubles down and he goes further. He says another thing. He says, God is light and in him, there is no darkness at all. And I want to talk to you about the truth of God. There's no darkness in God. None. I could ask you what synonyms for darkness are. And he'd say, you know what? Evil, wrong, sin, shortcomings, flaws, however you would want to, however you would want to describe darkness, we could say in him is no sin, in him is no flaw, in him is no shortcoming, in him is no brokenness, in him is no issue. And Jesus, John wants us to know that Jesus is pure light. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at pictures of the sun. If you've ever looked at pictures of the sun, which I don't recommend going outside today and looking at the sun, like, you know, just pastor told me to stare up at the sun, although it's not out today. Uh, I'm not telling you to stare up at the sun. Go on to your Google machine and look up pictures of the sun on your Google machine, okay? And you will see that ball of gas has dark spots in it. Even though it's a ball of gas and it, it burning and burning and burning and, and never explodes, it, it's burning. There are dark spots in that. Jesus isn't like that. There's, there's not a lot of light with a few dark spots in Jesus. He is pure light. He is in its purest form. In his him is light and he is light and in him there is no darkness. There's a reason that John sets us up this way that he wants us to know. I'm basing this off of what I've seen and what I've heard and I want to want to let you know that God is light and in him is no darkness because John gets ready to go on and talk about sin and the issues that it causes in our life. He tells us that in him there is light, he is light and in him there is no darkness at all and what he wants us to understand is this. If there's any break in the relationship that we have with God in every circumstance, it is our fault. Every time, every problem that we have with God, every issue that we have with God, every slip up that we have with God, every time we walk out of fellowship with God, every time we have a yelling match with God, every time we believe that God has come up short, the problem John wants us to understand <clears throat> The problem is our fault. That's hard to hear. Isn't that hard to hear? 
Because in no other relationship, I mean, if I were to go around and talk about your other relationships, we would all agree that sometimes when we fight with people, it's our fault, but we would never say every single time that we fight with somebody if we're humble. Because she's giving me some stank eye, and I'm like, you just ain't being humble. That's what you're not being. If we're humble, if we're humble, we would not say every time there's an argument that it's, that, it's, that it's our fault or that it's the other person's fault. I mean, if we're humble, we'd be able to say, hey, yeah, sometimes I, I'm not a nice person. I told him in service, there's about four minutes of every day I'm not a nice person. Four minutes. that I can. And there's other times in other parts of the day where I'm not a nice person, but there's four minutes in every single day that I know I'm not a good person. And it's the time it takes me to walk from the down the upstairs to the coffee machine. I'm not a good person. If you intercept me in that four minutes, we're probably not going to have a good exchange. It's probably going to be a bad exchange. I'm probably going to have to apologize later. You can go ahead and pick that up. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be a great person in that four minutes. I'm going to struggle in that four minutes. I know that about myself. I know that sometimes that I'll fight with my wife and that, that I've pushed an issue and I've gone too far and that I need to apologize. Sometimes Sometimes I tell her that she needs to realize she's wrong. It goes over well. After I wake up off the ground, she's like, you know what? I was wrong. There are times, there are times in every relationship, whether it's with a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a coworker, there are times we get in an argument, it's our fault. And there are times where you get in an argument and it's not our fault. With God, this one relationship, every time, if there's a break in fellowship, every single time, the ownership of of fault rests with us because he is light and in him there is no darkness in him there is no flaw now there are times where we feel like it's got to be god's fault it's got to be god's fault i if you if you haven't had a moment where you felt like god had a personal vendetta against you you haven't lived enough life okay you're a child and you're going to have to experience some more things we have all had moments where it's like this is getting heavy this is getting deep i don't know what god's trying to do and we don't want to come out and say you know what god what are you doing this is this feels wrong to me okay we won't say those words but we'll live that way right we'll live that way or we'll quietly believe like when does it end when does it when when, when does my time come for this to stop and we will go through those moments where it's like oh this is so much maybe maybe a marriage isn't working out really good or maybe maybe your finances are just destroyed or maybe there's sickness we've all experienced things we all go through these things and if and maybe it's just me maybe i'm the one that needs to go to the altar today and i will if i have to okay and i will lay my own hand on my own head and I will pray for myself. Okay. But I want you to understand there are times I've gone through things and I'm like, are you kidding me, God? I've had those moments. First four years of ministry, I was in youth ministry, served these kids with every fiber of my being, opened up my home. Man, they, they hung out with us. They ate our food. I spent time with their parents. And that was back when I thought parents were not cool. I was like 22 years old. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're 40. I have nothing to, I have nothing in common with you, sir, okay? But I will eat your food, okay? <laughs> and, and, and I would hang out with their parents and I got to know their parents. I'm gonna tell you, that ministry did not end well. It ended in heartbreak for me and my wife. And heartbreak. To the place where I didn't know if I'd ever go in ministry again. My wife didn't know if she ever wanted to go into ministry again. In fact, and I wanted to go into ministry again. She did not want to go into ministry again. We started a church and we started this church and it was just a really hard time, really hard time. And I felt like, I felt like, God, what, is this really what you have for me? This can't be right. Maybe I'm not called. Maybe I'm not called to this. Or maybe you don't realize, Lord, how bad your people really are. I want to use a different word, but they stink. <laughs> They stink. And if this is what ministry is, if this is, God, you must be great. You died on a cross for him, but I don't even want to spend time with him. God, you're great, but I'm not. I'm going to tell you right now, you called the wrong guy. And that was one thing that we went through. And then on top of that, on top of that, we're going through this transition. We're moving. We, 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 we're, 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 we're starting a church begrudgingly. She didn't want to start a church. And she's like, she's like, we're going to have a con I can tell she's got that. We're going to have a conversation. Like, why are you throwing me under the bus face? Um, 
she wasn't ready to start a church. And then all of a sudden, man, our second child comes along. Our second child has Down syndrome. And I'm like, are you, come on, for real? I'd gone to college to be a, I'd gone to college to be a, a, a pastor. I'm fertilizing lawns, riding a little fertilizer around. That's what I'm doing. After four years of ministry, I'm fertilizing lawns. I end up as a teller at a bank. Hated that. Oh, hated that. I hated fertilizing lawns too. Hated it. But I love my family. I kept working. I end up selling life insurance. God, are you serious? This is, this is my life. I'm selling life insurance, spreading fertilizer, and, and screwing up, counting people's money back to them. This is, my, this is my life. I went to school to be a minister. I was a minister for four years. I prayed with dozens and hundreds of kids. I had 400 kids come through my youth ministry in four years. We, we were averaging 80 to 90 kids on a, on a Wednesday night. We were the only game in town. We were in Mount Gilead, Ohio. There wasn't nothing else going on there. Nothing. Still ain't nothing going on there. We had a lot of, we had a good youth ministry going, man. These kids' lives were being changed. And I was excited. And this is how it goes. And here I am doing this. And now I've got a handicapped son. Come on. Are you serious, God? You ever feel like God's just piling on? I had that time where I felt like God was piling on. John wants us to understand the truth about God is this. If you fall out of fellowship with him, the fault, the ownership of fault is always on you. It's always on you. God never walks out of the room. You know that? God never walks out of the room on you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll go with you to the very end of the age. The Bible says he'll stay closer than a brother. God never walks out of the room on you, ever. He never walks out of the room. And yet we'll feel like God walks out of the room on us. Realistically, realistically, the truth of God is that he stands his ground in your life always always. And there's a greatness to that. There's a greatness to that, that he doesn't give up on us. There's a greatness that it has to be our choice to walk away. There's a greatness that it has to be our choice to turn our back and that he won't do it on us. And listen, sometimes that feels hard to hear that it was us that turned our back on him, but to know that God will never turn his back on us, no matter how angry we get at him, no matter how bad we fail, no matter how much we want to walk out of the room, God will never do that in return to us because he's light. And in him, there's no darkness. And that's only one truth of who God is. He knows the plans he has for us, plans to harm us, and plan, or plans to not harm us, plans to give us a hope but a future, plans to prosper us. He has these plans for us. And even though sometimes we feel like those plans aren't in our best interest, come on, if you would be honest, if you'd be honest, look over the, look over the landscape of your life. Look over the hardest moments of your life and things that you didn't think were going to turn out okay. I could tell you the moment that I just talked about in my life was the hardest thing that I had gone, gone through in my life up until the age of 26. And I thought it would never get better. Here we are in 2021. We've started three other churches, excuse me, four other churches. There's probably about 600 people that call Fusion their home because of what happened in Mount Gilead, Ohio. I have a family that I love tremendously. I was spreading fertilizer and counting people's money at a bank and selling life insurance, and I never thought I was going to be able to dig my family out of financial hardship. And here we are all these years later, and God has blessed us richly. And you know what? Sometimes, man, the hardest thing that you go through, man, it just feels like, it feels like you have a Judas experience, don't you? You know what? I, I, had, that, I had that Judas experience where it was somebody that was close to me that I felt like just stabbed me right in the back. But sometimes I learned this, man. Sometimes the kiss of Judas propels you into what you were put on earth here to do. And what you think is absolutely meant for your demise and to tear you down, it is absolutely the release into your destiny. And for me, it was the release into my destiny. Sometimes the, the hardest thing that we go through becomes the ministry. It becomes the testimony. It becomes the purpose of our life. And God uses it over and over and over and over and over. And out of your pain comes this incredible, incredible ministry. And out of your pain becomes comes all these new families and faces and comes all these souls and all these experiences. And you know what? God can do that, not just for me, but he can do it for you as well. 
The truth of God is that when it comes to the ownership, when it comes to the ownership of broken relationships, the broken relationship is always on us. The ownership of broken relationship rests solely on our shoulders. Now, that sounds heavy. Who comes to church to feel worse? Nobody does. Nobody says, you know what? I woke up this morning. I woke up this morning, and I was really hoping pastor would bring a word to help me feel worse about myself. And if you do feel that way, we got to have a talk because you're weird. We don't want you to feel worse about yourself. I don't want you to feel worse about yourself. I want you to understand the truth about God is that, is that the relationship of the, 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 the ownership of the broken relationship is always on us. That's the truth, okay? But he addresses the fix in the next couple of verses. It says that if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, if he's light and in him, there's no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk without him because he is light. If we're walking in darkness, we're walking without him, away from him. If we say that we have fellowship with, with him and we're walking away from him, we lie and do not practice the truth. The truth, that's another hard word. It's like, Pastor, I thought you said I was going to feel better about myself. No, I want to, I want to get you there. Just, just, just follow with me. We're, we're going to go on just a, a few more minute journey. But I, I read scriptures like that. And there was a time in my life after I, after I left that ministry in, in Mount Gilead. And even during that time in ministry in Mount Gilead as a youth pastor, for about, for, until about seven or eight years ago. So the time I really started in ministry to the time of about seven or eight years ago. There were times that I would read scripture like that one. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I would read scripture like that. I would immediately not think of myself. I'd think of somebody else. Because it's possible to claim we have a relationship with God that we don't have. It is possible. It's possible to say, you know what? I, yeah, yeah, I know, I know Jesus. I know Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's possible to think we have a relationship with God that we, we, that we don't have. It, it's possible to claim we have it, and it's possible to think we have it, and we don't actually have it. And it was always easier for me. It was always easier for me to think of somebody else. I'm a pastor, man. Like I pastored teenagers. Well, hey, buddy, if you would quit doing this and you were have fellowship with God, I could tell you four or five things right now. You can clean up. You could, you could actually have a better relationship with Jesus. And as an adult pastor, as a pastor of, of grown folks, you know, I, it's easier for me to think about other people when I see things like that. The truth about God is that, is that our relationship is broken with him. It's on us. But the the second truth is is that oftentimes we we look at other people before we really look at us, right? We'll look we'll think about somebody else. Well, ah, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm all right. I, we we think of ourselves as like forgiven sinners, but not continually having problems. You know, it's like well, I know I have problems, but I gotta kind of hide that problem. I don't want people to know. It's easier for me to think about fixing other people, isn't it? It's not easier to fix other people. It really isn't. It's not easy to fix yourself. It's not easy to fix other people, but it is easier to pay attention to other people. Maybe not fix them, but to point it out, right? We think of other people when we think of, well, you know what? They, they got, if, 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 if listen, I, I, we all have that coworker, don't we? We've got the coworker, that guy you think of when, you, you know, you can claim to have a relationship with Jesus, but clearly like he's got issues. You know, we think of other people like that, like, like you talk about Jesus, but I haven't used your name. You know, I haven't heard you use his name properly once yet. Like you, you, uh, you say it in vain and, 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 or you, you, you know, you, you, you talk about going to church on Sunday, but, but, but God knows what you did on Saturday. You know what I'm saying? saying we all got that coworker. It's easier to think about somebody else. It's easier for me to think about somebody else. I want to be transparent with you. It was always easier for me to think about somebody else. Somebody else when I was in youth ministry, it's easier up until seven or eight years ago for me to think about somebody else in the church. You know, I, 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 I know marriages that could get better if you would just stop doing this or just stop arguing like that. And it was easy for me to be objective about other people. I'm going to go ahead. You can put it up there. That was me. That was the first church we started called Pavilion. I said painted in the background. That's a storefront. That was me in 2037. I don't know what it was. I don't even know what year that was. 2007, 2008, something like that. Now I got to tell you, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, 
I didn't bring this picture in because I look like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, and I wanted to point that out. I brought this picture in because I had a, I had a visible thing in my life that was out of control for me. I was, I was obviously like, you know, eating a few more nachos than I should. That guy was broken. He's messed up. He really wasn't even ready to be in ministry. Had all kinds of issues, man. Was out of balance. Angry at people. Super angry at people. I would venture to say that that guy right there was doing ministry and he actually hated people. There's people in his life he hated. Hated him. Hated him. Telling other people how to live their life. Telling other people... You know what? You've got to have self-control. You've got sin in your life. You know, if you get the sin out of your life, you walk in fellowship with God, it'll be so good for you. That guy was a mess. I'm not saying this guy's perfect, but this guy's way more honest than that guy was. This guy is not perfect. He's not. But that guy wasn't perfect, and he wasn't honest about it. Had all kinds of issues, man. There were other addictions. That was just a visible one, right? This is the... I, and I'll say this in the church, man. We're really good at like dealing with addictions. Like, oh, you shouldn't use drugs and alcohol. But it's okay to be 400 pounds. It's fine. You don't have an addiction. Oh, I had an addiction. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I told people this like a long time ago. Little Debbie made me big Aaron. That's it. <laughs> I had an addiction. I, <laughs> somebody, you guys are going to use that one, aren't you? She, <laughs> she did. She did. She, she was a, she was a cruel mistress, old little Debbie one. I, I loved them though. And, but, but I had, I had visible issues and I had, I had issues that weren't visible. I also, I also high blood pressure, man, as soon as I would get mad, I felt like I was going to pass out. I just, and people would listen to me and it was so easy. It was so easy for me, so easy for me to recognize to recognize everything else going on in everybody else's life. This guy even blamed God. This guy didn't live according to point number one. This guy was in a spot when he first came out of that church where he was like, you know what, God, why would you do this to me? The truth about God was not that he was light and there was no darkness in him. The, the truth was is that the darkness that I was experiencing had to be because God had a vendetta out against me. That's where I lived. God, had, God, God, God was mad at me. God was angry. We do that sometimes. Like, God's angry at me. Like, I... I like to use that imagery that God's the angry kid with it, you know, with the magnifying glass and the burning the ants on the playground. We're the we're the ants. I thought that way. I I was living that way. I I, I had that anger toward God and. And, and, and I knew the truth about him. I knew that I knew the, the right words and I knew the Bible, but I didn't believe it. It's out of control. I would get up and tell people, people looked at me as a pastor and people looked at me as a, as, as a man of God. You're a man of God. He's a man of God. I wasn't. I was a man of the mask. I was professionally faking it. And sometimes I would say, so are, so are we. Preaching to people and still a mess. I wasn't best. I wasn't. I wasn't the best for my family. I wasn't the best husband I could be. I wasn't confronting my own demons from my past and my issues. Yet I was trying to tell people they needed to confront theirs. It was easier for me to, to believe that other people were lying to themselves and not realize I was lying to myself. Now, did God love me? Yep, he loved all 327 pounds of me. He did. He loves me now, he loved me then. Were my sins forgiven? Yeah, I believe they were. I believe they were. I, I believe my sins were forgiven, but was I in fellowship with him? 
Not if I look at the definition of fellowship. Fellowship defined as companionship, friendship, cooperation, solidarity. Was I in solidarity with God? No, I wasn't walking in solidarity with him. I, I certainly was not walking in, in cooperation with him. At that weight, I wasn't walking anywhere. I, 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 was not, I was not in friendship with him. I was not happy. I was not, I was not the father I should be, the husband I should be, the man of God I should be. Were my sins forgiven? Yes. Did he love me? Yes. Was I in fellowship with him? No. Now, as a father, if my kid does something I don't want them to do, and anybody that's ever been a parent knows sometimes your kids do things that you don't want them to do. I don't kick my kids out of the family when they do something like that. That, Like, hey, eat your broccoli. I'm not eating my broccoli. You're out of this family, Jack. It's over for you. Get it. You didn't take the dog out, and I stepped in a pile inside of the house, out of the family, banished. You know, could you imagine running your house like that? How fear, fearful it would be for your kids if you just banished your kids. Every time they messed up, you there was banishment, not punishment. Banished! Gone. We think God banishes us every time we, we, we mess up. I, I kind of I came up thinking that way, you know? I look back and I realize my sins were forgiven. God, God loved me. I asked him for, to forgive me. I asked him to save me. But I wasn't walking in fellowship with him. And just like a good father, when my kids mess up, especially if it's relationally, right? I don't kick them out of the family because they mess up relationally. They're still a part of my family, right? But I can tell you that our relationship is strained until there's a conversation toward reconciliation. And sometimes we don't have that conversation toward reconciliation because we don't want to. We want to we want to live angry for just a little bit and we'll feel that strain for a while. If you haven't had a strained relationship ever in your life, come on. You're just not being honest with yourself or, or, or you might not realize you were the strain. <laughs> um, but but, but we've all had strained relationships. We've all had broken fellowship with somebody, coworker, family member, friend, neighbor, where a conversation would fix a lot of it. I was in a, if I were to look back, I was in a strained relationship with the Lord right there. And I was the strain. He had not let me down. He had not failed me. People had. People had, and we'll complain the two. God, if the people of God fail me, clearly God, you failed me. No, the people of God are still, what was the first word I said? I didn't say God, I said the people. They're still people. They're still people. And we like to, we like to, we like to numb down and dull down the, the problem that people has. Like we, we talk about the word sin and we've really made it really just more attractive in the body of Christ. I got to wrap up, I really do. We've, we, we've, we've made it more attractive. Like I don't, I don't sin, I I, I have flaws. I'm only human, right? I make mistakes. I miss the mark. Listen to me. I, I, I want to be honest. We need to call it what it is. All flaws are sins. All mistakes are sins. All missing the mark are sins. And the reason I want to call them sins is Jesus doesn't forgive. He, he, Jesus didn't come to save, to seek and save that which was lost, lost in what? Lost in sin. He didn't, he didn't save those who lost in their flaws. He didn't save those who are lost in their mistakes. He came to set the sinner free. He came to set the sinner free. And if we would recognize that oftentimes, oftentimes, oftentimes in our broken fellowship with people and in our broken fellowship with God, the truth about God is that in him there is no darkness. The truth about us is that sometimes there is. And we cannot find the truth of God until we're willing to deal with the truth of us. Man, if you were writing something down, that is daggone good. I'm telling you right now, I could end right there and be like, that was good. You can't come to the truth of God until you come to the truth about yourself. I can't arrive at the truth about Jesus until I'm willing to be honest with the truth about me. And the truth about me, the truth is still about me. The truth is still about me is I'm not perfect. The truth still about me is I still need to confess my sins. I still today will need the blood of Jesus in my life. I, I confessed and had the blood of Jesus cover my sins on uh, just a month before my 16th birthday, which was 24 years ago. I'm old. I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. But I still need the blood of Jesus today, just like I did 24 years ago. Why? Because I still 
I still, I was raised, I, I was raised, I was raised in such a way that I truly believed, and I'm not talking about my mom and dad, but the kind of the old church kind of thing was that, hey, when you accept Jesus, you don't ever sin again. Holy cow, was that not true? I was 16 years old, and I was thinking, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not allowed to make mistakes anymore. I made thousands of them, thousands of mistakes, thousands of mistakes. And now that I've studied the word of God, I realize, man, that some of these words that we, that we take, you know, confess your sins and you shall be saved. We look at that as a one-time event. And some of these verbs that John writes down are in the present tense or they're in the future tense. And there's a reason they're written the way that they are. We still continue to make mistakes. The truth about us, the truth about him is that in, he's light and in him there's no darkness. The truth about us is that we got to be honest about the truth about us. We have to be transparent with the truth about us. And the truth about us is that we still need the blood of Jesus today like we needed it yesterday, like we needed it the day before. We're going to need it tomorrow. I'm going to need it from, from the four-minute four walk from my bed to the coffee pot. Blood of Jesus is what covers that four-minute gap. Every day. That's the truth. I need that over and over and over in my life repetitiously because I want to stay in fellowship with him. And I recognize that there is a truth about fellowship. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. So we recognize the truth about him. We recognize the truth about us. And we have to recognize that there's a truth about fellowship, wanting to stay close with him. And the truth about fellowship is we have to walk in the light as he is in the light. We can't live in the darkness and try to convince people that we're walking in the light. Walking in the light does not... Li listen, if he is synonymous with the word light, walking in the light means walking with Jesus. Walking with Jesus. Jesus. Why well, go to church, pastor? I'm on the right path. I read my Bible. I'm on the right path. I want to tell you this. Walking with Jesus is the only way the path will have light. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Some of you got to go home today, right after church, which is going to be no problem because there's light. But I will tell you this, if it was nighttime, and I said, listen, we'll get you on the right road. We're going to put your car on the right road. You're going to have the right starting point. You're going to know this road takes you home. Here's the deal, though. Can't turn on your headlights. No headlights. Good luck. You're on the right road, but no illumination. Going to church, man, that's starting on kind of the right road, right? Yeah, reading your Bible, that's starting kind of on the right road. Walking with Jesus is where the light comes in. Staying close to the light. Why? Because it's not good enough that I start off on the right path. I need him to help keep me on the path. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, I thought you said reading the words just the, the right path. It's also the light. Jesus is the light and he is the path. His word is the light and it is the path. Wait a second, it can't be both. Yes, it can. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes of the Father except by him. He said that I am the light of the, light, light of the, light of the life. I'm the light of the world. I'm, I, I'm a, and, and then he tells us that we're going to have that light. He also says this about his word. The Bible says in John, in the book of John, that the word was with God and the word was God. You have to actually have the word of God in you to have Christ in you. He is the word become flesh. And so we want illumination to our path. We want to be able to walk according to the statutes and the way of God. We want to have fellowship with him. You have to walk in the light to have fellowship with God. Listen, he's not going to kick you out of the family because you have a momentary lapse of judgment and you make a stupid decision. Can I just be honest with you? It's going to happen in your life. You can come, Pastor Josh. You can come. You can come. You're going to have moments where you don't make the right choice. I won't even ask by a show of hands who since they've accepted Jesus has made a wrong choice. <laughs> we all have. We all have. Some of them simple. Some of them complicated. Some of them simple. Some of them complicated. We've made right and wrong choices even since we've accepted Jesus. But I want to tell you this. You have to make a choice to walk in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And as we walk in the light, we enjoy this continual cleansing of Jesus. We're not we're not a one and done church. 
We're not a church that believes, man, you pray this prayer, then you just walk out of here and then everything's going to be right for the rest of your life. Like you don't have to keep, listen to me. We believe you keep walking. Walking is a verb. It shows action. You keep serving. You keep coming. You keep putting Jesus in front of you. You keep moving. The Bible says that he cleanses us from all sin. I love this because John the verb that John uses for the word cleanses is in the present tense. It's in the present tense. It's not in the future tense. We're not going to be cleansed or it's not even in the past tense that we were cleansed. John uses the word in the present tense, meaning that we are cleansed immediately today. We're cleansed today. And when we read that scripture tomorrow that he cleanses us from sin, our yesterday becomes our today. And our tomorrow our tomorrow is, a, is ahead of us. Our cleansing is still ahead of us. Tomorrow we're going to need cleansed. And that verb is still in the present tense. He's cleansing you today. When tomorrow comes, he's cleansing you today. When next week comes, he's cleansing you then. Next month comes, he's cleansing you then. Next year comes, he's cleansing you then. Because it's in the present tense. He does it every single day. He washes us and he renews us every single day. When we fail and we confess our sins and we come to the Lord, he cleanses us immediately. It's immediately over. We're immediately cleansed. The truth about him is that, yes, in him, there is no darkness. The truth about us is that when we fall out of fellowship, it's our fault. But the second truth about him is he handles our problem and restores fellowship based off of what he did with his son, Jesus. And he does it not once, not twice, not three times, not five times. He does it any time we come to him. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You know, the best thing about it is all unrighteousness. Man, people will treat you like that, that prayer you prayed years ago. That was for what you'd done in your past. You prayed that prayer is in your past. It's in your past. God forgives you of your past. The Bible does not say that God forgives you of your past. Listen to me. That's not, that's not what it says there in 1 John. It says that he cleanses you from all. Everybody say all. A-L-L. Cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Means the sin of yesterday, gone. The sin of today, gone. The sin of tomorrow, gone. Gone. All. All your sin gone thank God well pastor I believe that you got to confess your sin to be saved I believe you got to confess I believe you got to ask for for Jesus and forgiveness but I also know this there's a truth about forgiveness it says if we say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness all unrighteousness If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He cleanses us from all sin and we confess our sin. But that word confess, it translates as a verb in the present tense as well. And the idea is that we we should keep on confessing our sin instead of referring to a kind of once and for all confession that we keep on confessing our sin we keep on telling god listen sit confession is not what forgives you though it's not what it's not what cleanses you some people would say well you know what pastor you have to confess to be cleansed no 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 that's not what the bible says that's not what the bible says the bible says it's the blood of jesus christ that cleanses us You don't have to go to a confessional to confess your sin. You don't have to go to a confessional to confess your sin. You don't have to wait till you get in front of somebody that's holier than you to confess your sin. When you mess up and you feel convicted, you say, God, I'm sorry for that. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. You're confessing your sin by saying you need to be cleansed and you need to to be forgiven for that. Our sins are not forgiven because we confess. If this were the case, if forgiveness for a sin could only come because there was confession, then we would all be damned because it would be impossible for us to confess every sin that we commit. Do you know there are sins that we commit that we don't even recognize we commit? There are thoughts that we think that we don't get confessed. There are times where we, we let our mind go too far and we forget to confess that sin. It's not our confession that forgives us 
We are forgiven because our punishment was upon Jesus and we are cleansed by his blood. Confession is good for us because we are telling him, I recognize that the shortcoming in our relationship, I recognize that the fellowship has been broken because of my sin. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking to be in fellowship with you. Lord, I want to enjoy the blessings of fellowship. Lord, I don't believe for two seconds that you kick me out of the family when I mess up. I don't believe for two seconds that when I fail you, for for a couple of moments. I don't believe for two seconds that you kick me out of the family. But Lord, I want to enjoy the the blessings of intimacy. I want to enjoy the blessings of fellowship. I want to know what it is to walk in your favor. I want to stay close enough that my my path is illuminated. I want to hear your voice. I want to stay close enough to hear your voice. And so God, I'm confessing my sin today, not because I don't think I wasn't forgiven, not because I don't think I'm not good enough, but because I've allowed distance to come in between me and you. And I don't want a distance in between me and you, God. I'm telling you, Lord, nothing else in my life will do. Lord, nothing else can fill that gap. Nothing else can solve my problems. Nothing else can fix the brokenness that's in my life. Nothing else can change that guy's life that was up on that screen. Nothing else can heal the hurt that was going on in him. Nothing else. I'm going to have you stand to your feet today. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. There are parts of this that I didn't go down in this message, but I want to tell you this. I was good at wearing a mask. I was good at wearing a mask. And I love the Lord, man. I don't want you to think I didn't love the Lord. I'll tell you right now, never in my life have I not loved the Lord. There's just been times where I hated his people. I'm just being transparent. Hurt. I've always loved the Lord. Christians, man, we're, 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 we're a billboard for him either way, whether it's positive or negative, we're a billboard for, for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I had issues with his people. I wore a mask, man. I was broken and I was hurting. And here's the thing, as a pastor, I didn't feel like there's anybody I could talk to because I didn't feel like church people could handle me not being perfect. Can I just tell you, man, I don't wanna build a church where you have to wear a mask. I don't want to build a church where you got to come in hurt and fake like you're great. I don't want you to have to fake the problems and the pain and the brokenness that you have in your life to placate people that are sitting around you. If anything, John was saying, listen, be real. Be real. If you say that you don't have sin, you're lying to yourself. If you say that you don't have brokenness, you're deceiving yourself. Don't deceive yourself. And by by the way, while you're at it, don't worry about deceiving anybody else either. You don't have to be fake here. Just be honest. Because when you come to the truth about yourself and when you're finally honest about your own brokenness, that's when you come to the truth about him and realize that he fixes what's broken. And I want a church that handles that well. I can't promise you. I can't promise you that the person standing to your right or your left or your front or your back will handle your brokenness well. But I promise you, I will. I promise you, Jesus will. I promise you, if you come to me and you say, you know what, pastor? No, I'm not okay. Now, I want to let you know right now, you come to me and you say, you know what, pastor, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with sexuality. I'm struggling with pornography. I'm struggling in my marriage. I'm struggling with drugs. You know what me and you are going to do? We're going to get right down here. We're going to pray. I'm going to call you the next day. Like, How are you doing? You're not going to shock me. You're not going to surprise me. And God's not going to fall off of his throne. He's not. He's not going to fall off of his throne because you're struggling. You don't have to wear a mask. Be honest be honest let's be an honest church can we be an honest church can we be a church that handles people's brokenness with integrity can we be a church that handles people's hurt as one of our highest priorities can we believe that this truly is a hospital that he truly did come to seek and save that which was lost that he came for those that were in need of a physician can we be Can we be nurses in the kingdom? He's the doctor, we're the nurses. Some of you are like, I didn't sign up to be a nurse. Yes, you did. I want to be that. I want to be a place where people can become broken and eventually, over time, leave whole. Boy, it would have helped me. It would have helped me a whole lot. I want to tell you that. Don't wear a mask. I want to pray for you today. 
Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. And Lord, there are times my thoughts aren't, it's a whole lot sharper in that picture. My brain worked a whole lot better. But Lord, there are times where, there are times where my thoughts don't say exactly what I want to get across. But I know wholeheartedly, Lord, that there are people in here that are broken, that are hurting. I know there are people in here that have have made mistakes that we regret. Lord, let them know today they're in common company. We've all got things we regret. We all do. We all do. But Lord, there are people that have stayed out of church because they felt like they had to be something they weren't. They felt like they were raised in an environment where they had to be perfect and they're just not able to be perfect. Lord, that is not what the body of Christ was ever supposed to be. Lord, we are becoming, we are being transformed into the image of God. We are learning to walk like Jesus. All of us are growing in this place. All of us have brokenness in our past. And so, Lord, this should be a place where people can come and say, you know what, I'm not okay. I'm struggling. This should be a place where an addict can come and can find healing. This should be a place where marriages that are really, really at their very last should be able to come and say, you know what, we're going to rally around you. This should be a place for somebody who's struggling with everything that they've ever done, Lord, and just this should be a place where people can come and handle that. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to be that place for the person that is broken, I pray, Lord, that today you would whisper in their spirit, you found home. This is home. I pray that they would know they're safe here. I pray that they would know that you love them, that you've never left them, you've never forsaken them, and that you care about them right where they're at. Lord, I ask today, God, I ask today, Lord, that you would fill in the gaps of our life, fill in the broken spots, Lord, nothing else will do. The holes that are in our life, the pain that's in our life, nothing else will do. I'm asking today, Lord, heal. Heal. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to offer this one thing, man. If you're not walking in relationship with Jesus, maybe you've never prayed that prayer before where you said, Jesus, I need you to be the Lord of my life heard about you but i'm not walking with you or for you maybe the 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 issue is fellowship you see this and you're like man i i haven't been transparent i i'm out of fellowship with god i'm not as close as i want to be and that describes you i want to pray for you today before we go if you'd be honest enough to say you know what I've, i've either never started a relationship with jesus or be honest enough to say i'm out of fellowship with him right now with every head bowed every eye closed I'm going to have you put your hand up on the count of three. We're going to pray for you. Listen to me. (laughs) Listen to me. I was raised in an environment where you couldn't even pray that prayer without coming to the altar. I was told you got to do it at the altar. You have to do it at the altar. People have to know what you're going through. I'm not looking for you to be transparent to everybody else in the room. I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. Are you right with Jesus? If you're not, and you're ready to be, on the count of three, put your hand up. We're going to pray. One two, three. See that? See that hand? Come on, you don't want to walk out of here. You don't want to walk out of here not right with the Lord. Yeah, amen. I see that. We're all going to pray together. We're just going to pray together today. And then we're going to go. I'm going to ask you to join me in this prayer. Just say, Dear Jesus, I recognize today I want to be honest with myself. I want to be honest about myself. I'm not perfect. I have flaws. I have sin. But I also realize today that Jesus loves me and that he takes care of my sin and cleanses my sin. And today I'm asking that you would come into my heart, be the Lord of my life, cleanse me of my sin, and be my savior. Guide me, lead me, and be the lamp under my feet. I give you all of me so I can have all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you for those that prayed that prayer today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the people in here that I believe heard this and just needed to hear that it's okay to not be okay. 
for the people in here that hurt. It's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to bring that not okayness to people in the church and know that you're going to be loved on, know that we're going to walk through it with you, that we're going to go through the low lows and the high highs with you, and we're always, always going to be heading toward the cross. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would heal, that you would use this church to heal. Father, that you'd be with us throughout the week. We love you. We thank you. We ask it all in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you as you go. Love you all so much. You all are wonderful people. We'll see you next week.